here's an idea to get you thinking. At the moment, when we start meeting again for services, we cannot sing together. Uh, one day that, one day that will, will come. Looking forward to that. What if I said, we will not sing any hymns until we've learned to sing at least 100 psalms? Well, I'm not going to say that, but, but what if I did? Is there any good reason why I shouldn't? After all, these psalms are songs given by God himself. And surely we should learn God's songs before we start singing hymns by Isaac Watts or Charles Wesley or Stuart Townend. If we did commit ourselves to, to learning to sing 100 psalms, we'd find ourselves singing words that are a bit unusual for your standard hymn. We'd sing a lot of songs, words about being attacked. So Psalm 54 verse 3, arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me, people without regard for God. And second, we sing a lot of songs about God's judgment. Verse 5, let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. And if you know the Psalms, Psalm 54 is by no means the only one that speaks this way. But Psalm 54 is a good one for, to help us think about these issues, in part because Psalm 54 is quite short. There's not a great deal else going on, so we can focus on these key questions. Now, there's a simple shape to this psalm. It goes, God, I have a problem. This is the problem. God will sort out the problem. This is how we sort out the problem. God, thank you for sorting out their problem. So you start at one place, you kind of go on a journey, and then you return, um, as it were, to where you started, but now things have changed. A lot of the Bible has this sort of shape. It's called a chiasm, after the Greek letter chi. It's like, a, like an X sort of shape. And usually when you find this shape in the, pat in the text, the centre is the key point. That's the heart of the matter. So the centre of Psalm 54 is verse 4. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Now there's a verse to memorise. Write it on a post-it note and stick it on your fridge. Scribble it on some paper and blue tack it to your mirror. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. If you forget everything else in this sermon, remember verse 4. Maybe I should even test you. Well, the psalm starts off with, um, there's a problem and this is what the problem is. Save me, O God, by your name. This is verse one. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. People without regard for God. David's in trouble and he needs help. And a lot of time, isn't that exactly what prayer is? I can't cope with and I need you, Lord, to step in. But what an amazing privilege that in Jesus Christ, God's ears are attentive to our words. His, he does listen to the thoughts of our hearts and the words of our mouth. Notice how he says, save me by your name, vindicate me by your might. I am not mighty, I am not powerful and strong. My name, my character is not outstandingly amazing. When I pray, I appeal to, to God's name. I call out to, to God's strength and might. Don't ever pray as if you're the answer to your prayer or that you deserve an answer. No, prayer is confessing our helplessness, but God's willingness 
to answer. Don't ever imagine you are strong enough to live the Christian life. You're not. We pray because all our hope on God is founded. Well, David's problem is that arrogant foes are attacking me. And the heading to the psalm tells us a bit more. This is the period of David's life when he is on the run. You may have read about it in the morning readings in the last few days. When we looked at Psalm 52, there it was Doeg the Edomite who was the one um, against David. And uh, Doeg was one of King Saul's senior staff. Here in Psalm 54, it's the Ziphites, the people from the town of Ziph. Uh, these are people from David's own tribe, the tribe of Judah. These are people who should be close to him. They, they should be his allies, but they've turned against him. So there's that real sense of betrayal from those close to you uh, is lingering in, the, in this psalm. Despite their geographical, their kind of relational closeness to David, they are people without regard for God. You see, without regard for God, the strongest is the winner. Without regard for God, the ends justify the means. A society without regard for God is one where evil is going to flourish. But I guess it's not normal for us to experience this in, in all its a potential horror. We live in a country where the rule of law is not perfect, but it's a lot better than much of the world and most of human history. We live in a world where the justice, in a country where the justice system is, has its problems, but it's so much better than much of the world and most of history. So we rarely find ourselves in a situation where our life is being threatened, where people with power are out to get us. But it is the experience of many Christians around the world. It's the experience of many of our brothers and sisters. China, where the police intimidate Christians and arrest pastors. Parts of Nigeria, where Christians are frequently attacked by militia or terrorists. There is a slaughter of Christians going on in parts of Nigeria that very rarely makes the news. In many of these places, Christians can't go to the police or the state or the courts because often that's where the problem's coming from. Here in the West, verse 3 might seem weird, arrogant foes are attacking me. How can we relate to verse 3? Well, maybe we can't, at least not for ourselves, but we can pray for our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters. See, if we, if we sang these psalms, we'd at the very least have to think about the, the global church and the persecuted Christians worldwide. Christians living in countries where the rule of law and the justice system um, do not hold back those who are powerful and are attacking. So we get to verse 4. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. David looks at the situation and he sees trouble. So then he by faith looks to God. I know I've said this before to uh, many of you at different times but You've probably heard people say, I'm talking to myself, it's the first sign of madness. But it's not true. Talking to yourself is potentially the first sign of spiritual health. When you're overwhelmed with, with choices and decisions, you need to say to yourself, God is in control. Jesus is on the throne. He has this. When fear and anxiety plague your heart, you may need to say to yourself, Jesus loves me. He's committed to my eternal good. When guilt or shame weighs you down, you might need to say to yourself, 
The blood of Christ has washed away my sin. If you find yourself walking in the valley of the shadow of death, you may need to say to yourself, Jesus is my good shepherd and he has conquered death. David here is, is talking to himself. He is confessing his faith. He's speaking the truth so that he hears the truth. He, he's speaking the good news of Jesus to himself. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Can you see why it's so good to, to memorise these verses? Memorising verses gives you weapons in the fight against doubt and despair. And if you really can't memorise, stick it on the fridge or by the mirror so that you can be reminded of this truth about Christ to strengthen you, to help you. You see, verse 4, verse 4 is, is dealing with David's heart and mind. Before then, verse 5, he asked God to deal with the, the situation that's, that's troubling him. Well, what does he pray about the situation? He's already, um, he's already prayed so that his heart and mind can find strength. Now he prays that God would deal with the situation at hand. And this is his request. Verse 5, let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. Again, these are the sort of lines that can make us very uncomfortable in the Psalms. And we read them and we're not quite sure what to do with them. We're not quite sure if they should be there in the first place. But notice two things here. First of all, this is a prayer for justice. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. There are people doing evil, and the prayer is they'd experience what they've done to David. The prayer is they get a taste of their own medicine. Out in the internet, you can find videos like, um, uh, you see this one where a man decides to, he wants to break into a car to steal something. He picks up a heavy rock, throws it out the window and it bounces back and hits him in the, in the, and knocks him out. And no one really watches that video and says, oh, the poor man. Now you watch it and you think, you deserve that. You've got what you deserve. It's justice. And then second, this is a prayer that God would be the one who delivers justice. In your faithfulness, destroy them. David does not pray God, in your faithfulness, give me strength to destroy them. He says, God, you do it. Uh, whenever we see these sorts of prayers in the Psalms, the, the request that the wicked are, are judged, there's another line that's used a few times, I think, God, break the jaw of the wicked. You know, if somebody is speaking such lies and violence, God, Lord, shut them up, break the jaw of the wicked. But it's not saying, Lord, give me an opportunity to break their jaw. It's not that at all. It's saying, God, you deal with it. It's a very real, raw request. But it's handing it over to God. It's leaving judgment, justice, vengeance. You know, when vengeance in the right way is, is when people get what they deserve. It's leaving it in God's hands. We see that, that David took this to heart. David's the one who writes these words, but he took to heart that he was entrusting judgment to, to God. The introduction tells us that, um, as we've seen already, when the Ziphites went to Saul to say, isn't David hiding amongst us? And that happens two times in 1 Samuel 23 and 1 Samuel 26. And on both occasions, the betrayal by the Ziphites is followed by David letting God deal with, this, deal with the situation that he faces. So that both those betrayals are followed by two times uh, when David has an opportunity to harm Saul. And he refuses to do so. On two occasions, 
um, Saul is almost literally in David's hands. And Saul is the one who's out to try to kill David. But David does not bring judgment. He entrusts that to God. See, these verses in the Psalms that, that seem violent are actually about not being violent. Instead of, instead of us being the ones to retaliate, take revenge, bring vengeance, these prayers are about entrusting the whole situation to the Lord. And having entrusted it to him, we can walk the path of peace. And we see this in Jesus himself. You could actually read Psalm 54 as the words of Christ, couldn't you? Betrayed by Judas, who went to the rulers and leaders and said, is not Jesus hanging out in the garden of Gethsemane? Jesus had arrogant foes attacking him. Jesus had ruthless people trying to kill him. How does he react? He trusts God his Father, and he entrusts the situation to the hands of his Father. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus there is an example for us. Don't try to bring judgment yourself. Let God deal with that. And there's a, a theologian um, who wrote a very good quote about this whole uh, way of thinking. He's called Miroslav Volf. He's a theologian who lives in America but grew up in Croatia. And as you know, Croatia saw some terrible violence in the 1990s. But it's seen a cycle of violence across centuries. And he wrote... In a world of violence, we are faced with an inescapable alternative, either God's violence or human violence. And then the next quote is a longer one. But what he's doing, he's, he's resisting the idea that God does not judge. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people in the West don't like the idea that God judges. And he says, you can only really cling to that idea if you've grown up in comfortable surroundings. Um, whereas if you've grown up in, in violent situations, you know, the only answer is, is letting God deal with it. So um, let me read from uh, his, uh, one of his books. My thesis, he says, is that the practice of non-violence requires a belief in divine vengeance. My thesis, he says, will be unpopular with man in the West. But imagine speaking to people, as I have, he says, whose cities and villages have been first plundered, then burned and levelled to the ground, whose daughters and sisters have been raped, whose fathers and brothers have had their throats slit. You point to them, we should not retaliate, Why not? I say the only means of prohibiting violence by us is to to insist that violence is only only legitimate when it comes from God. It takes the quiet of a suburb for the birth of the idea that human non-violence is the result of a God who refuses to judge. In a scorched land a land soaked in the blood of the innocent, the idea will invariably die like other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind if God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a a final end of violence. See, that God would not be worthy of our worship. In other words, he's saying, if you say to people who are experienced violence, you shouldn't retaliate. They'll say, why not? We, the the lands, we, we cry out for justice. You can only say, do not retaliate, if you say, but God will sort it out. There is divine judgment. 
so you can pray. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. Because you're saying, God, you sort it out. I can't do it. You sort it out. And God, who knows the situation perfectly, will sort it out. Jesus himself entrusted the whole situation he was in as he faced death on the cross as an innocent man under the oppression of arrogant people. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. This is how persecuted Christians, suffering believers across the ages, find themselves able to hope. They know, surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. And so they can praise God even in the trouble. And one day, every believer will be able to say the words that end the psalm. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I'll praise your name for it is good. You have delivered me from all my troubles and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. One day, every suffering believer will be able to say, God sorted it out. God sorted it all out. And he's brought perfect justice to the world. So what if we decided to learn 100 Psalms to sing? It'd be quite a challenge, wouldn't it? Um, but the benefits would be amazing. We would be strengthened for trials and tribulations. We'd be comforted with the knowledge that God judges. And that's just the beginning. Why don't you start today? Not trying to learn 100 Psalms to sing, but start today with, with verse four. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me.